I've been thinking a lot about the short story um, this year, especially because uh, this year I've been a judge for the story prize. And as I was thinking about the short story, I was telling Charles that you just want to go back and read the masters, you know, and see what, what can I learn, what do I know, what, what makes a short story um, truly, truly great. And so, of course, I looked at Chekhov, I looked at Alice Munro, I looked, of course, at Charles Baxter, and I read Griffin again and again. What makes these stories so great? And especially a couple of stories in there, the title story, and a story that's really dear to my heart called Royal Blue. Um, and I thought, wow, can a collection cannot get any better than this. And then I got this collection. <laughs> and I don't know how many of you have read it yet, but if you haven't, you are in for an extraordinary treat on every single level. Um, I highly recommend that you buy it tonight. I assume we'll probably run out of books. And if we run out of books, you run out tomorrow and buy it, all right? Um, because it's an extraordinary book from so many points of view. And if you're a writer, and I see a number of writers in the room, hi, it's good to see you all here. Um, you, there is so much to learn from reading and reading and rereading these stories, as I'm sure you know. I'm not going to read Charles' um, bio, because you all have it um, on your chairs, and you don't need me to read it to you, because you can are all readers. You can read it yourself. And I also don't need to show you a picture of them because I've already seen it now. Um, so um, let me just say how personally thrilled I am to be here tonight with such a wonderful writer and all of you. Um, please join me in welcoming Charles Baxter. Thank you, Nomi, and thank you all for coming, and in fact, it is warm here, so. <laughs> when I uh, emailed my friends in New York to ask what the weather was like, they were saying, oh, it's terribly cold. And I, I'm from Minnesota, <laughs> I can't be serious. Uh, so I thought I would talk uh, for a few minutes about this book and where it came from and how it got to be what it is. And then uh, I'm going to read, but I'm not going to read from it. Uh, you can, if you want to buy it, you can read it. I thought what I would do is read a scene that I wrote for one of the stories in the book that I did not include. That is the scene. I did not include the scene in the book, and I'll try to explain why. Um, so the calendar pages fall from the wall, and it's about six or seven years ago, and I was completely dry. I had no idea of what I wanted to do for, for my next book. And I, um, I was really desperate, and I went back through some old notebooks and some drafts of stories that I had been working on around the time that uh, my second book, Through the Safety Net, came out, which means that these were pages from 1985. And this is how old they were. They were typed. <laughs> and I, I found a, a, a story that I had abandoned of, about a, a woman who goes into a postpartum depression and uh, cannot cannot somehow manage to do child caring and who leaves her husband, leaves the baby in his care. Um, I, I had written about five pages of this and I didn't know enough about her. I thought the tone was wrong. Uh, I couldn't write it. Well, I picked up these pages and thought, oh, I think I know who she is and I think I know who should narrate this story. So I went back to work and I finished it and the title that I gave it was Loyalty. Uh, and subsequently, I had been to Prague. I um, had, there were certain images from that city I wanted to get into a story and uh, I began working on a story that had at its core 
a quarrel between a husband and a wife about who was going to feed the baby, which was a quarrel also from about 35 years ago that I happened to be part of. <laughs> <laughs> and I wrote that story, and when I was finished with it, uh, I gave it the title Bravery, and I thought, oh, that's very interesting. I'm giving these stories the names of virtues. And I thought, nobody is ever going to buy a book called The Virtues. <laughs> but I, I thought, well, let's just see where this goes. I, had, I don't know how many of you ever saw, I'm sorry, this is very discursive. Um, it was about 15 years ago, there was a series on PBS called The Decalogue. A group of short films made for Polish television by Krzysztof Kozlowski. Uh, and I had always remembered that series and some of those Eric Romer films about the virtues. And I thought, well, I can, maybe I can write a book with stories, five stories about virtues, five stories about vices. And I, I was giving a reading when I was working on this, uh, Penn State Erie. I had finished about three or four of the stories and I was talking to the audience about what I was planning to do and a guy in the audience said, raised his hand and he said, are the same characters going to turn up in the vices that are in the virtues? And I said, what a great idea. <laughs> so he's acknowledged in the book. Uh, so I, I set to work on this. There are a number of my former students in the audience, and the reason I mention that is that sometimes with my graduate students, I have harped on certain things that you can do to get stories going, and I've been very keen lately on what I call the request moment. That is, having at the beginning of a story, a character turn to another character and say, if you love me, there's something you'll do for me. Uh, where did this come from? I had seen a production of Hamlet, and I thought, uh, in the opening scene, that's very interesting, the ghost of Hamlet's father appears to him and says, there's something I want you to do. I want you to avenge my death, I want you to honor your mother, and I want you to remember me. If you love me, you'll do this. Uh, and then I happened to see or to read King Lear, and I thought, same thing. The play starts with King Lear saying to his daughters, there's something I want you to do. And this was a phrase from my childhood anyway, because my mother was very bossy. And, uh, so uh, my brother thought it was hilarious when I gave the book this title. He said, you're quoting mother. <laughs> I'm going to read to you a passage that I cut from the story Chastity. Uh, I, th I thought Chastity was going to be the hardest one of the virtues to manage. And what I finally decided was that I wanted to write about irony. And irony as the form of the new, ch the new chastity is irony. Uh, and what I'm going to do is, uh, this is not the opening scene. The, the main character in this story is a guy named Benny Takamitsu, uh, who one morning is getting dressed and he hears outside his apartment a scream down the street. He doesn't know what it is. And he doesn't actually know what to do, but when he hears it again, he rushes out to see if anybody is there. And nobody is, but there's a little red hair, a little curl of hair on the sidewalk, and he picks it up and he puts it in his, in his pocket. Uh, and he has a discussion with his friend about what we should do in the city when we hear noises of that kind. People seem to need our help, and you don't know what to do. In any case, uh, after that discussion, this scene arises. That weekend, on a Saturday afternoon, 
Benny swung by his mother's house, a large ramshackle vine-covered tutor where he had grown up. She had invited him over about some matter that she wouldn't specify. Her front lawn, dotted with crabgrass and creeping Charlie, hadn't been mowed for over a week, and a green water hose unattached to the faucet or sprinkler was splayed out in an S pattern close to the sidewalk. The hose would leave that pattern on the grass once she picked it up. From habit or politeness, he rang the front doorbell, inspiring a weary bark from the dog inside. And when his mother didn't answer, he walked in, sniffing the old familiar smells of peppery vinegar and wood, before he advanced through the living room where Lucille, the ancient mutt, lying under the coffee table, thumped her tail in happy recognition when Benny greeted her and scratched her behind her ears. She did not bother to get up. At her age, it was too much effort. Through the kitchen window, Benny saw his mother in the backyard doing her daily solitary yoga exercise. She stood in warrior pose. You all know that. <laughs> she stood in warrior pose, her arms extended at shoulder height, and her head turned so that her eyes gazed over her left hand. A lit cigarette hung from her mouth, <laughs> and she squinted through the smoke. His mother's hair was graying rapidly now. The sun lit it so that the gray had a kind of cool radiance. An ashtray and a cell phone rested on a nearby tree stump. After going out through the back door, Benny went up to his mother and kissed her cheek on the side away from the cigarette. Hi, darling, his mother said. What a pleasant surprise. Want to join me? She brought her legs together and raised her arms in the sun salute. I don't know, Benny said. After a moment, he said, no, I, I don't think so. <laughs> she lowered herself into a downward-facing dog. The cigarette and the posture gave his mother the appearance of someone trying to improve her health and to ruin it simultaneously. <laughs> Her ex-husband, Benny's father, a businessman named Edward, had left her several years ago for a younger blonde, Benny's age. The split had liberated or destabilized his mother, Benny wasn't sure which. She'd become sweet and vulnerable to fads, and she had taken up smoking. She was no longer characteristic of herself. For years, she'd worked as an elementary school teacher and had imported into the household the strict habits she had acquired taming second graders. Her starchy passion for order had been her essence. Now she was somebody else. He didn't like this particular person his mother had turned into, but you don't have to like your mother. The whole business goes deeper than that. <laughs> If you're not going to do yoga, then just go over there and weave the garden until I'm done, she said, showing a trace of her old familiar bullying. <laughs> Benny sauntered towards some peonies and, down on his knees, started weeding. The soil underneath his fingertips, the soil nestled under his fingertips as he worked. He loved the coolness of dirt and felt that he owed his mother this favor. When she had finished her yoga, bringing her hands to heart center, his mother walked over to Benny and kissed him on the back of the head. You're getting bald, she observed. Her voice had acquired a phlegmy rasp from all the cigarettes, and she sounded like a labor organizer at the end of an all-day meeting. <laughs> Thanks for dropping by, she said. We might as well skip the small talk. You know, dear, I have to steel myself to say what I'm, what I'm about to say to you. There's something I want you to do. Benny flinched. Standing up, he told her, that's the second time this week someone has used that expression on me. That's a common expression, his mother said. She lit another cigarette and started to massage her cheekbone. Well, I'm, I'm not used to it, Benny told her. 
Maybe you should be, she replied. People should ask more of you. You've led an undemanding life, though I don't mean that as criticism. Anyway, here's what I want you to do. Yes. She put her hand on his shoulder. The sun continued to burn down on her gray hair. Don't be mad, okay? Anyway, it's a small request, she informed him with the ghost of a mocking smile. Here it is. Her voice suddenly rose. Damn it, Benny, and forgive me, but I want you to get married and have children, please. <laughs> and I want you to do it pronto, right now. I'm tired of waiting. Listen, I don't have all the time in the world. And I'm out of the usual pleasantries. You want to see my Medicare card? I can show it to you. You act like there's no urgency to anything. Whatever stands in front of you, you saunter to it. Stop sauntering. Stop lollygagging. Find a woman, anybody, I don't care, and love her. Do you understand what I'm saying, honey? Do you have any idea at all? Of course I do, he said. But that's unfair. What you're asking me is... He searched for the right word and couldn't find it. I'm not interested in fair, she told him. You're my only child, and I want grandchildren. That's just about the only thing I want, and I want them right now, before I'm dead. At once, the steam appeared to go out of her, and her arms fell down to her sides. Well, she admitted, I've always been too direct. Your father used to complain about how I would say anything to anybody and could mess up any social event we were invited to. He said, I was brash. Oh, I hate that word. But the point is, you're loitering through existence, and I'm running out of time. I know it, and I can feel it. And I'm sorry I called you a zombie. Actually, Benny said, after a long pause, you didn't say that. You were just thinking it. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody called me a vampire a few days ago, so I guess monsters are in the air. I guess so, she said. You want to have some lunch? I could make you a sandwich. No, Benny said all at once registering a touch of delayed anger. With him, anger always arrived belatedly, long after the moment when it could have been effectively deployed. I've had lunch. Mom, have you checked the time? He displayed his watch. No, you haven't. It's 3.30 in the afternoon. Her inability to be prompt for appointments had become a new annoying wrinkle to his mother's character and somehow had become lovable now to everybody except Benny. Her indifference to punctuality was a mannerism. Out of spite, she was turning herself into an old hippie. She put her hand on his arm, apparently from sheer affection, and she smiled at him. But her breath smelled of the menthol cigarette whose butt she had tossed into a bed of petunias a moment ago, and of the new one she had in her mouth now. OK, she said, no sandwiches for you. By the way, your grandmother, Takamitsu, wants to see you. Your father called to say that she's bored and wants visitors. You see, that's what it's all about, grandchildren. Your father says she's starting to lose her memory. Well, I won't pester you about it, about the grandchildren, I mean. All at once, Benny felt himself losing his temper. What the fuck, Ma, he said. You are pestering me about it. He felt he had a right to his anger, even if it was delayed. So, okay, I'm going now. You've told me what you wanted to tell me, and I'm out of here. I'll be seeing you. She gave him a long, appraising look. You shouldn't say fuck in front of me, she said. <laughs> I don't like it when you do that. It's very coarse and trashy, and it reflects poorly on me as a parent. <laughs> and as for tact, no, I never had a firm grasp on that particular virtue. So that's the scene that's called. Uh, and in the next scene, Benny is out walking uh, in Minneapolis, near where I live. And he's walking along the Mississippi, and he comes to the Washington Avenue Bridge, which is a kind of cursed bridge in Minneapolis. 
uh, because the poet John Berryman threw himself off of it. And he sees a woman who's, who <coughs> lifts herself over the railing and seems about to jump in. And he rescues her. Uh, and I, I, I won't read the whole scene. I'll just read uh, one page. Um, he goes up to her, she's at the railing. Seeing him out of the corner of, his, of her eye, she turned and smirked. Stop, he commanded. Wait, don't. He wasn't sure what to say. What are you doing? Who are you? I'm nobody, she said. Who are you? Well, I'm just Benny, he said. That's dangerous, what you're doing. Please, what, why are you doing that? No reason, she said. For fun, cheap thrill, I'm bungee jumping, she said, only without the bungee. See the cord? <laughs> she pointed down to where, no, to where no cord was visible. Just kidding, she said. It's imaginary. Also, I was feeling really cold behind my eyes, so I thought I'd do something exciting to heat myself up. Her speech style was oddly animated, and she seemed very pretty in a drab sort of way, like an honorable mention beauty queen who hadn't taken proper care of herself. Something was, was off in the grooming department. Her long brown hair fell over her shoulders and her t-shirt had a corporate logo and the words, just do it, <laughs> across the front. Her eyes, when she glanced at Benny, were deep and penetrating. Her feet and sandals displayed toenails polished a bright red so that under the streetlights, they had the appearance of war paint. She gave off a shadowy gleam I've been feeling kind of temporary lately, she said. How about you, Benny? You've been feeling permanent? He reached out for her arm and clasped it. Yes, he said, I have. So, please come back. Fuck you doing, she said laughing. Don't harass me, let go. Let go of me or maybe I'll actually jump. Irony was the new form of chastity and was everywhere these days. You never knew whether people meant what they said or whether it was all a goof. And actually, when I wrote that sentence, I thought, maybe I'll have a book. <laughs> and of course, she's the woman he marries <laughs> and has a child with. Uh, that's where the story goes. Uh, I have uh, read for, um, what, 20, 20 minutes? Um, and I think the uh, uh, protocol is uh, to open it up to discussion or questions now. Um, uh, I, I, I may need prompting on this. Uh, uh, quest so questions uh, of, of, of any kind? Yes? about why you didn't include that scene. You said you did not include that first scene you read, right? Yeah, I, I did not include it. Um, there were a number of reasons uh, that uh, I, I, I took it out. The, the first was that it seemed to me too clearly uh, causal. That is, if I had it in, uh, the reader would think, oh, Benny is just operating the way he is with the woman he meets on the bridge, whose name is Sarah, because he's under orders from his mother. And I thought, that's, that's too schematic. I mean, these stories risk seeming schematic anyway. And I didn't want to make it even more so. Also, I thought the tone was wrong. Um, and it, the rest of the story is rather somber. And it seemed to me that the way I had written the scene was a little bit too much at Benny's expense. Uh, and it was, it was too lighthearted. What I came to feel was that it, as a scene, it would be fine in a novel. But in the book of short stories, uh, it, it, it was too... Um, discursive. So I took it out uh, and there's 
own, there are two lines in it that I feel I have to preserve somewhere and put somewhere. And those lines are, you don't have to like your mother, the whole business goes deeper than that. I, I've, I've just got to use those lines somewhere. Uh, I can't throw them away. Uh, uh, so, also, the way many of you do, uh, I, I was, I had sent the story out to various friends and said, well, what do you think of this? And uh, one and all, they said, you've got to take out that scene between Benny and his mother. And sometimes that just makes me belligerent. <laughs> But in, but in this particular case, I thought, no, I'll, okay, I'll, I'll take it, I'll, I'll take it out. Um, yeah? Um, your answer to this question may be embedded in everything you just said, mm -hmm. but um, can you say something about what made you decide to share that scene with us tonight? Because I think it, there's a kind of peculiar logic to... to bookstore readings and other kinds of readings in which the author opens up his or her book and says, okay, now I'm going to read to you from chapter four. And all of you have probably been in bookstores when somebody has the book and opens up the book to that chapter and starts reading along. And sometimes you think, I sometimes think, oh, I could read, I could read this better than the authors. <laughs> And the author is reading it, and, and you, just, you just think, after a while, blood is coming out of your ears, and you think, oh, let it be over, please. Uh, and, uh, I suppose, you know, I had, I had, um, I, I had seen enough movies on DVDs, and I had seen deleted scenes, as we all do. And I thought that particularly because I was going to be in an audience with a lot of other writers uh, who think very seriously about what to include in, and what to cut, it might be interesting to read something that I had cut out of the story. Uh, and that has been published nowhere. And uh, it's a way that I get to recycle it too a little bit uh, and to revisit it. Uh, the, the first time this ever happened, that I ever saw this happen, was, was with a writer who's almost completely forgotten now, a, a writer named J.R. Salamanca, who uh, uh, wrote a, 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 a long, mostly wonderful novel, uh, well, several novels. He wrote a, a book called Lilith that was made into a movie with Gene Seberg and, and Warren Beatty. Uh, but he wrote a, lo a long novel uh, called Southern Light, uh, and I once heard him read a, a, a scene that he had taken out of that book, and I never forgot it. And I thought, well, if I ever have the opportunity, I'll do the same thing. Yes. <laughs> I know I, I loved your essay that you wrote many years ago called Against Epiphanies. Oh. Can you discuss a little bit about what you do to end the story or um, just discuss story endings in general? <laughs> It's, uh, I don't know if you, if you all heard the question. Thank you for the question. Uh, the, the, the question is, um, is, many years ago I, I, I wrote and published a essay called Against Epiphanies, and the question is, what do I do, or how do I think about endings? Uh, and like many of you in this room, I have a terrible time with endings, uh, and sometimes feel that they're nowhere in sight. But I, I, I do, generally speaking, uh, feel that if the question that the story is posing at the beginning of the narrative is somehow answered or flips over into another question, 
near the end, along with the sense that something is rising to the surface and becoming visible that was not visible at the beginning of the story, then we're in a kind of privileged position. Uh, we have been allowed to see a, a series of actions that have resulted in something that has been hidden coming up to view, whether in the behavior of the characters or in what they say or in the way that they're reacting to the situation that they're in. Um, sometimes the ending will simply announce itself, you don't have to think about it. Uh, but at other times, I, I, I think that, that often what you're looking for is the combination of the inevitable surprise. And what it is in the story's materials that will lead to something that is both inevitable and, and surprising, and you think, of course. Of course this is where it was going. Of course, this is where it had to eventuate, but I have to say that when I'm writing, these rules of thumb are, are almost useless to me. <laughs> almost useless. I, you know, I'm digging a trench. I don't know where it's going. I don't know how to get to where I want to be, and I'm just managing it anyway that I can, and I just keep asking the characters, what are you doing in my story? What do you, what do you want it, what do you really want to do? Why are you here? Um, and then, of course, I try to get them in trouble. <coughs> and um, you know, Richard Bausch once was asked, where do your stories come from? And he said, in a slight southern accent, I think of characters whom I love, and then I visit trouble upon them. Uh, and I, I do that too, and then when, when the trouble seems either to be evaporating or turning into something else, I may have the end of the story. Yeah. Yeah. Eugene, do you have a question? <laughs> No, I, I'm sorry, I shouldn't pick on you. No, sorry. No, I was just glad that somebody asked about the deleted scene and how that wasn't included. Oh, yeah. That was mine. Yeah, that was great. Okay. okay. <laughs> yes? I, I actually had a structural question. Mm -hmm. this, the characters do appear again in the vices, the characters mm -hmm. from the virtues. Did you know... Did you know... How... how how much did you structure that in advance? Did you know Benny would be this virtue and this vice? Or how did that arise? No, I didn't match them up. I, I just, I, you know, when I was thinking of Benny and I was thinking of what kind of trouble he had gotten, he might have gotten himself into, what sort of love trouble he might have encountered when he was a younger man before he went to architecture school. I just thought, okay, let's see where I can take this. Um, I, I need certain constraints, I think, um, before I, I can get started. Um, w. H. Auden always used to say that, that, that the more constraints that were on him, the more he liked it. Uh, and I, I liked feeling that there were certain things that I had to do within the stories, but that beyond that there was a kind of freedom that I had and I could go anywhere. Um, I could go more or less anywhere with it. And, and various parts of my life started to figure into the stories, and I would donate you know, these, these events to my characters. I was um, in, a, in a limousine going from Palo Alto to um, the San Francisco airport, and the limo driver fell asleep behind the wheel. <laughs> Uh, when he picked me up, he, he, I, I said, how are you doing? He said, I'm, I'm very tired. I got no sleep last night. I said, well, we can go to the airport. And, no, no, it's, he said it's fine. So we got on, I, I think it's Interstate 10 that, is, um, that, that goes into San Francisco. And I, I was thinking of my own things. 
And uh, he, when I looked up into the rearview mirror, I saw he was asleep. And it had started to rain. And I said, Khan, and he said, what? And he slammed on the brakes, and the car first started to fishtail, and then we went over the edge, and we started going down. Um, and you want to hear what I... Yeah. <laughs> um, I haven't read it before. Uh, what I remember about it was that Khan was uh, screaming, um, and he, the previous time he had taken me to the airport, he asked me if I had thought about hell lately. <laughs> and I said I hadn't, and uh, he, he said, it was very interesting on the subject, uh, but I thought it, 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 as we were tumbling down that hill, I thought, Oh, Khan is screaming. That's interesting. Because I was very quiet and my cell phone had come out and it was sort of... <laughs> Christmas is coming, the doctor thought. The geese are getting fat. A child's rhyme from elementary school. Please put a penny in the old man's hat. Why are the geese fat? Who feeds the geese? If you haven't got a penny, what will do? The doctor heard a sound, he's driving the car, heard a sound without definition, and the road tilted a bit. Then things were flying around him. The cell phone had escaped from his coat pocket and was airborne in front of him, as were various other items, including the bags of snack food and a clipboard from the front seat. And he heard the sound of crunching or of some huge animal chewing up the car as it rotated and fell down into the ditch. And Elijah, now thoroughly awake, felt his driver's side door open. How had that happened? And he was ejected sideways, having forgotten to buckle his seatbelt. Uh, I thought, you know, I've been in a rollover accident. Who's been in a rollover accident? I gotta I have to use this. Um, and, um, I went into the I, I went into what was the question? What am I answering? <laughs> um, I went into a kind of shock. You writers will understand this. When the car finally came to rest and it was right side up, uh, I, I managed to, my door wouldn't open, but the other one would, and I got out, and then I managed to get Khan, who was just bleeding down, who had broken his back. Uh, and uh, I got him flat down on the ground, and my only thought was, is my laptop okay? <laughs> it was crazy. I mean, that's the way, that's the way you think about things. Um, so, I, I mean, the question, of course, was, was about this, the constraints, but I'm also saying that I think it, if the form that you've settled on is capacious enough so that you are open to whatever happens to you and what you're thinking and what you notice and what you remember about people, the story will become alive on it, will come alive on its own. Um, at the, I mean, I understand that some of these stories may, ske may seem schematic, but I need a sort of schematic to get started. And what I'm trying to say is that I, I, I try to keep it open enough so that things can go in. Yeah. Yes? Can you give us another example besides the request moment of how, when some of those constraints are in place, you get a story started? Sure. Um, and for some of you who have been in my classes, you've, uh, you've, you've heard this before. Um, in some of my workshops, I used to say, where's Captain Happen? <laughs> And it's a kind of shorthand. Captain Happen makes things happen. And Captain Happen is the figure in your story or your novel who will say what other people won't say and who will do what other people won't do and who will often get a story started 
by um, disinhibiting the action of the story. Uh, I, I like to think that of, often for, uh, for a, a good opening of a story, uh, you can have a character who's a sort of Captain Happen figure in any kind of situation. Uh, at, an example that I've used recently is at halftime, the quarterback came into the locker room and said he wasn't going to play in the second half. Another kind of story. Down at the end of the block was a house with all the, with all the blinds drawn into which nobody ever uh, entered and out of which nobody came out. It, it, it's, if you put these things at the beginning of the story, it's as if the story is asking a question, what's that house, what is it about? The quarterback, but I, I also like at the beginning of a story something that I've called the one-way gate. And, and the, the one-way gate is a character does something and having done that thing, he or she can't get back to the place where she was before she did it. And the situation cannot get back to, to that place either. I mean, I think these, these are only rules of thumb, but they're, they're sometimes useful when you get stuck. You, you think, well, where's Captain Happen? What do these characters want? You know, and, um, Who's going to get in trouble here? What kind of trouble can I get these people into? Yeah. Yeah. Sheila. So um, some of the stories, so there's some workings of the stories that are they're happening in dreams, and in some cases there's a couple of places there's visions. And I'm wondering if you can comment on the choice to uh, dip into the surreal. Yeah. Um, I felt uh, when I was working on the stories that these stories were not going to take place entirely in the world of realism and not entirely in, in the world of fantasy either. Um, that in fact what I, what I wanted, and this seems horribly pretentious, and, but I'll just say it, in almost every story I wanted a moment where the images started to turn into something like a vision, where the imagery was um, so clear and yet so enigmatic that, um, it, it, that in some sense it might be slightly obsessive, and I was hoping that I would pass that obsession on to, to the reader. And, I felt you, I could only get to those images and those visions if I destabilized the stories and got them slightly out of standard realism into something else. There's a wonderful passage in uh, Gerard Manley Hopkins' uh, journals in which he talks about widowed images. And these are images uh, for which you cannot find the law. These are, these are images that have been widowed from the meanings that once gave rise to them. And because they're widowed images, they have a kind of obsessional visionary power. And uh, I've always loved that idea. Um, and I think, and I sometimes think, I don't see why fiction writers can't. Uh, import that in, into their work, and that's that's why so many of my stories occasionally stall on an image that coalesces everything that that has been happening up until that point. Um, but it, it certainly is not standard realism by any means. Yeah, Casey. <laughs> Um, I'm curious, I, I thought it was really interesting in the example you were using of um, thinking about the concept of chastity and, and through this kind of lateral move where you're thinking about it as uh, irony. Yeah. So I'm curious if there are other examples, if there are other ways that in the course of writing this book, 
your ideas about virtues and vices either began to shift or you had sort of different perspectives on that. Right. right. The question is, since I, I had started to think about chastity as a kind of new or contemporary or irony is a new contemporary form of chastity had I started to think of any of the others in, in that way. And I think the, the answer is, is yes. Um, and I'm, I'm now sort of going through my mental Rolodex thinking about how these, well, sloth, for example, the story sloth, is not just about sloth, it's about depression. And that particular condition you get into when you're depressed, uh, in which nothing holds any interest for you anymore. The books that you have no longer seem interesting. The, the, the music that you once loved has no interest. You can't see any reason for getting out of the chair. Uh, you know, it's abulia, it's acedia, and so I tried to write about about it that way. Uh, I, I, and I tried to. There were other stories, gluttony, uh, some of the other vices. I was trying to give a, a, a positive spin to. Uh, and in this book, uh, lust turns out to be. Uh, something that's keeping uh, a dying man alive and not doing it but hearing about it. Uh, and so I, I just kept thinking, how can I flip this? Where can I take it that the reader won't be expecting? Uh, but when I arrive there, it will seem right. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. yeah. Um, just back to what you began with. Um, when you're in a workshop with graduate students and you say their story stalled and isn't working, you say, bring somebody on and say there's something I want you to do. Is that is that dramatically different than somebody who sets out to do something for herself? Do you see what I'm saying? I, I, I do, Al although I, I would also say, I, I don't know that I ever did that to you guys, did, did I? I don't think I, that I gave you um, a formula. If, if a student comes in into the office and says, I've got this draft, I don't know what to do with it, I don't know where it should go, do you have any ideas? Um, I, I, I will sometimes say, there's nothing I can do for you uh, apart from asking you, what are the, you know, the, the, some of the standard questions. What do these characters want? What are, what are they afraid of? What's at stake in this story? Um, I, I think stories that stall out often will have somewhere within them a a, a germ that will lead the, the writer to the proper conclusion. And usually it just has happened that the writer hasn't found the right angle. And what I try to do, what I tried to do when I was, uh, when I've been teaching, there are a number of my former students in the room, is first simply to describe the piece back to the author. This is what I think it is. This is what I think you're doing. Um, d does that does that align with what you wanted the story to be? It's it's hard to know how to advise people when when their stories go flat on them um, without actually trying to write the story for them. I think I think some of the times that that your work is at its best. Is, is where somebody has said, there's something I want you to do for me. Mm -hmm. uh, the first thing I read of yours, it was Hugh and Darcy, it was First Light. Uh -huh. And uh, Hugh had somebody say very early on, yes. there's something I want you to do, yes. I want you to take care of Darcy. Yes. And he has a kind of pulse and a kind right. of momentum. That's right. Kind of that. yeah. 
it's a, its own own kind of first letter. Yeah. I think I think you do that wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I think it's been going wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, it's really nice to hear you talk about um, instructing in right. <laughs> It's really nice to hear you talk about sort of how you can guide students. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm wondering if you have any, as someone who teaches, if you have thoughts about how writers tend to sort of guide one another and respond to one another, and, and sort of if there are things, since you've talked about things that you know can be helpful, also what are the things you see writers do with one another that are actually not helpful or don't <laughs> in the way that they want them to be. Well, you know, my first teaching job at the university level was at Wayne State, where I ended up teaching a lot of composition classes. And I, I had read Peter Elbow's work on uh, composition pedagogy. And one of the central ideas in it is first thing you do is describe back to the reader what you see on the page. And because I had never taken any creative writing classes, I thought, well, maybe this is a useful pedagogical tool. And often, the writer, him or herself, is maybe only dimly aware of what's actually in the story and the direction it's going in and, and what it's doing. So I, it just seems to me an act of generosity to uh, a, a writer to say, this is what I think your story is about. These are the forms that you're using. This is the way it's shaped. And uh, I, you know, I think this is a fairly common pedagogical um, tool in creative writing classes. Um, if, if you're asking me about how um, creative writing or how writing pedagogy can go wrong, how long do we have? <laughs> One of the most wonderful writers of the 20th century uh, I um, witnessed at a famous writers' conference uh, when I was a fellow there. And the first day of class, uh, he began by, we had a manuscript in front of us, and he said, there's a sensitive adolescent in this story. And he glowered at us. <laughs> I hate sensitive adolescents. <laughs> well, if you don't like sensitive adolescents, who do you like? Bullies. <laughs> they make much better characters in fiction. Next day, there's a dream in this story. <laughs> I hate dreams. <laughs> Why do you hate dreams? And then he said something very interesting, which is, dreams don't lie. And that when writers put dreams into stories, usually they're giving the reader kind of thematic tool for reading the story. I thought that was pretty smart. I've never forgotten it. Um, there's a sex scene here. <laughs> If you, this is this is an actual quote. If you can't write a love scene as well as William Faulkner, you shouldn't try. And we were all. <laughs> What's he thinking of? Flem Snopes and his cow? Yes, yes, he was thinking of Flem Snopes and his cow. Um, so, I mean, he practiced the workshop as a kind of stand-up comedy routine. Uh, and what it turned into was a, a series of lessons on how to write like him. Uh, this is Stanley Elkin. Uh, he was a wonderful teacher. But you had to be tough. You had to be able to stand up to that. Uh, and I think, you know, most writers in workshops are fairly fragile, I was. Um, and that's why, if you start, I think if you start in too early saying, well, what I liked and what I don't like, the writer will just, the person whose work it is will just shut down. You can see it in their face. They're just, they won't listen. But if you say, this is what I think your story is about, this is what I think you're doing, 
then there's a sort of opening. And they'll be able, if you have a suggestion that makes sense to that person after the descriptive part has passed, then they'll be able to hear it. They can't hear it if it comes right at the start, which is why I think you, it's not a good idea to start a discussion with praise because you're just waiting for the other shoe to drop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who are some of your favorite writers who are lesser known or you think are underappreciated? Writers uh, who are lesser known and who are underappreciated. Well, every time I come into New York and I look over at Brooklyn, I think Paula Fox. Everybody should be reading Paula Fox more than, than they are. Um, what, a, what a wonderful writer she is. Um, <clears throat> I don't know, this city is full of memories for me. And because I, I knew William Maxwell a little, uh, I always mention him. But I think among writers, he's, he's now pretty widely, pretty widely read. Um, uh, who else? Um, I was just rereading uh, Oblomov. Do you guys know that novel? Uh, by Goncharov, Ivan Goncharov. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful novel about a guy who almost never rises from a chaise long. He's in it for 400 pages. Um, and it's, it's an astounding novel about happiness. Uh, uh, and I, I love to recommend that book. Um, the, the Wall Street Journal asked me to write a column, the Wall Street Journal, why? <laughs> um, a column about a certain subject, and I chose sloth, and I put Oblomov at the top. There's an African-American writer named William Demby, he was almost completely forgotten. He was brilliant. He was a brilliant writer. He wrote a book called Beetle Creek that a, a number of people have read, but he wrote a novel called The Catacombs. And if it were in my power to get a book back into print, I would get The Catacombs by William Demby back into print. If, if you guys can find it, get your hands on it. It's just astounding. It's a wonderful book. Um, I don't know. I think that's that, that's a start. That's a start. No more. No. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. All.